What's up, guys? We are live. I'm really excited tonight. We're going to hang out for a bit here. Hope everybody's having a good evening. Looks like a bunch of people are jumping on. And uh, hey, if you're watching this live, make sure that you drop in the comments if you got any questions throughout this whole thing, because I am going to be answering, doing Q&A kind of as we go. I'm going to just answer it as we're talking. And on top of that, uh, if you are watching this after it's been recorded, go ahead and still drop your questions in the comments. And uh, I will go back over time and just answer your questions and you'll be notified with the answers. So just uh, get it, uh, plan on being uh, involved here with me. This is gonna be a live discussion and uh, excited about it. All right, so hey, today guys, I wanted to talk about um, not only doing like live Q and A, but also kind of go through what type of framework I would put in place in order to go out and build a portfolio day one, like starting completely fresh in 2023. This is, in my opinion, the best time to buy mobile home parks um, in our recent history. And the reason I say that is because if you think about it over the last, you know, shoot, three, four years, prices have been ridiculous. Things have made zero sense to buy. And you know, it's very, it's been very challenging to pick up good deals. Now, yeah, we've bought them up and down uh, as the market's been up and down. But at the at the same time, I'm really looking for uh, looking forward to. Um, hey, what's going on? People are starting to hop on. Well, uh, hola, what's up? I don't know who that is because it doesn't tell me the name. But, anyways. Um, yeah, so really, it's it's just been challenging to buy really good deals over the last few years. So we're starting to see some softening in the market, and we're starting to see all these things that we'll talk about later in this discussion. So make sure that you stick around. I promise I'm going to give you tons and tons of value throughout this entire discussion. Uh, so stick around. So, you know, we've got a lot of good deals coming in right now, and I'm really excited about that. I'd say probably Q4 of last year, it just really picked up. Like we started seeing a lot more deals that were starting to make sense. Really, uh, what's up guys? What's up, Mark? Let's go. That's right. Um, hey guys, drop your questions in the chat or in the comments or uh, say what's up because I want to make sure I get whatever you guys have to ask answered. All right, so... I was thinking about this the other day and I'm like, you know, how would I start over if I had to? Like I've bought over a thousand lots. We own communities in like five states now working on our sixth state as we speak. And, um, you know, I just was like, could I start over? Could I do it? And of course my answer is, yeah, heck yeah. I've got the information. I know what to do to go rebuild this thing all over again. And if I was looking at getting into real estate today, and this is, I know this is going to sound kind of biased because I'm in the mobile home park space, but if I was going to start in real estate in general, I would be looking at all the different property types and I don't see a single, what's up, Cody? What's up, dude? Um, yeah, let's roll. So uh, I, I don't see a single property type that is positioned better than mobile home parks right now. And so I, I, I was basically thinking, okay, how can I put this in a simple framework that we can talk for like, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour here and give you that framework so that you can at least kick it off and get it going. So, you know, that's what we're going to do. All right. So one thing that I want to point out is that regardless of the market, regardless of anything that you see, it's going to be heavily weighted on you. When in 2014 and 15, when I was buying my first parks, um, it was, it was kind of like not a really hot time to be buying real estate. It was still coming back from the earlier two thousands and people were like, Oh yeah, it's, you know, still not, not a good time to buy. And then you get into, let's say, you know, the late 20 teens and people start like going crazy. I bought all through that. And then also as the market has started to soften, I've been buying more aggressively even now. So just what I want you to get from this, if anything today, is that you can build your real estate portfolio regardless of the market. It's more based on you, 
your work ethic, your skill set, everything that you're willing to do and the energy you're willing to put into it and the education that you're willing to take on and, and pick up in order to go make it happen. Okay. It's funny because when you think about it, there are people that have been sitting on the sidelines for years talking about what they're going to buy or what they're looking at, and they've struggled to go out and get deals. Then there's others who have been buying the entire time. Think about that. What is the difference between them? It's not the market. The market's the same. It's a level playing field for everybody. It's the person. It's their mindset. It's their work ethic. It's their knowledge. It's all of that together. So that should give you some confidence that the only thing that you're missing is something that you control, not the, not market, not industry, not interest rates, nothing like that. What's up, guys? Uh, <laughs> what's up, Kent Rogers? Kelvin, what's up, brother? If you guys are looking to get into mobile home investing, not mobile home park investing, but mobile home investing, check out Kelvin. Him and I did a couple interviews recently, and uh, Kelvin's uh, a goat, as they would call it, in the mobile home investing industry. So welcome, dude. What's up, Judah? We got a bunch of people hopping on. What's up, Mark? Man, good to have you guys on. Make sure you're dropping your questions in the chat and in the comments, I'll be answering them as we go. So I've been helping my students um, in real cash flow coaching program that I put together, basically take advantage of the short window of opportunity that I see in the mobile home park industry. Right now, we are taking advantage of two things that don't happen often, okay? Number one, interest rates. The interest rates being high like this is historic. It's historically high. You know, for decades it hasn't been this high. So we're taking advantage of that. But also, there's a once in a lifetime opportunity with mobile home park investing that will never come back. And that is the fact that our industry is consolidating. And think about this: every industry only consolidates once. It only happens one time. And on top of that, almost every other real estate industry or property type has already consolidated. It's all professional institutional operators that run all these properties. If you think about apartments, um, retail, office, industrial, even self-storage has went through the consolidation phase. It's it's still kind of late stage that, but there these, these property types have all went through consolidation. They're all being run by professionals, and there's a lot of data, and they're very fluent markets. But mobile home parks haven't. So they're going through it right now. And we're probably mid midway through the movie. Okay. So what I mean by that is we've got a few more years to take advantage of this before we will only be buying from professional operators out there. And although you can still buy, it just becomes more and more challenging because when you're buying from people who have been running their properties professionally and maxing them out for years and they really know what they're doing and they have access to data and systems and tools and software and great professional people and standard operating procedures and you know industry um, common or, or norms that they're operating on, it's very hard to find margin, right? It's really hard to find that big value add that you can double the value of a property or that you can get in and buy something at a great price. But mobile home parks, we can because a lot of these longtime owners have owned these properties for so long. They've ran them. What's up, Martins? And I'm I'm seeing a bunch of people hop on here. Um, so yeah, I mean we've they've been running these properties for so long, and a lot of times it's been a lifestyle business. It's really been a lifestyle business where. They've been able to go to the beach, chill out. They're free and clear. They're not really worried about maxing the properties or keeping rents up or, you know, billing back utilities or doing all these strategies to maximize cash flow because nobody's looking at it but them. They don't have investors. They don't have return metrics that they're paying attention to. It's just something that they developed over a long period of time, own it free and clear, and they're just making money on it left and right. So we come in, we say, cool, we'll buy it for today's value, but we can, we see all these opportunities to max out these properties and just explode the value in it. So if you know what I'm talking about, if you've already kind of heard about mobile home park investing and how this consolidation is happening, um, go ahead and give it a like. And, uh, let's see how many people already kind of know what I'm talking about. Hit the like button. Um, all right. So combination of that consolidation as well as interest rates. Interest rates are high right now. 
Well, you might think that's a bad thing, but for buyers, it's a good thing. Who cares what the value is today on your current assets unless you have to sell? So if you're not selling, what does it matter? What I'm focused on is being able to buy when interest rates are high. And then from there, as the interest rates recede back down, which most, most people believe those interest rates will come down in the next year to few years, you're now going to create a spread in value. You're going to create a ton more cash flow by refinancing that property. So there's a ton of opportunity kind of all coming together at the same time right now. And it's not going to last forever. All right. So if you guys want to learn how to take advantage of this and even potentially partner with me, because I'm partnering with people in my coaching program as well to help them go out and do this, just private message me the word learn or just go to getrealcashflow.com. Again, that's getrealcashflow.com. And you can check it out and uh, watch the case study and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. So let's get into this. Let's talk about this framework. If I was starting out from day one, it's 2023, never bought a mobile home park. Shoot, I never bought a single family home. Let's say I'm still renting in a, in a one bedroom apartment somewhere, never even bought a personal home. What would I do? What is that? Yes, biggest value opportunity. I totally agree, man. All right, preach. I'm getting so true. I'm getting a bunch of... Uh, bunch of uh, backing here in the comments. You're rooting me on. I'm like a preacher with, with them yelling in the background. Jives me up. All right. So um, what would I do to start fresh and build my portfolio all over again? And, and let me add, I would build it so much faster than what I have to this point. Like if I could start over and I knew what I know now, oh crap, I would be so much further ahead in such a short period of time. So let's do this. The first thing that I would do is I would ask myself, what am I doing it for? Like, what is the goal? What am I trying to hit? Because depending on what you're targeting, what you're going for, that's going to determine what you're basically what you need to do to get there, right? So if all you're trying to do is buy one property, cool. Then you can back into those numbers. You just need to make X dollars per month to retire. Great. Back into those numbers. You can do that in the next few months. Like that's very doable. And I'm not trying to exaggerate. You can literally buy one property, change your life. Okay. Or maybe it's, you want to really build up some serious wealth. And that number is you want to make a million dollars a year, a couple million dollars a year, whatever it is, I don't know. Okay. But you can back into those numbers and determine basically how many lots you need to own in order to get to that point. So that's the first <laughs> preach Mario. Uh, so basically, you're going to set your goal, if you want to call it that. You're going to figure out the metric, the financial metrics around it. What does it actually cost to do that? Maybe it's just buying a new Aston Martin, okay? Or maybe buying a new Ferrari. I, I mean, maybe you make great money at your job and you just don't want to use your income from your business or your job to go buy some fun stuff, but you just want to buy some real estate that then kicks off enough cash flow to go buy the toys. That's what I'd recommend you do. Okay. So figure it out, whatever you're working for, whatever you're trying to accomplish back into those numbers. Pretty simple. The next thing I would do is I'd studied up, I would study up hard and I'd start looking at real deals immediately. When I look back at everything that I've ever been successful at, okay. I've always just absorbed as much information as possible. I mean, you could like when I started investing in real estate, you could not pull me away from a real estate book, a real estate. We didn't have podcasts back then, but a real estate books, I, they did have bigger pockets. And I was, I was reading through bigger pockets like crazy. Um, I, I joined multiple courses. Like there was nothing you could do to stop me from just absorbing information quickly because I knew that if I learned it quick, I could get started quickly. I knew that if I didn't have all the information, or enough information, I wasn't going to actually be able to go do a deal. And I'd probably waste a lot of time. So I just, I've always absorbed a ton of information, very quick, learn things as fast as possible. Not because I'm a quick learner, but because I, I force myself to just absorb a ton. Um, so now, so once basically you've started studying up, then you're going to start looking at real deals. And the reason I say I would start looking at real deals very early on is because 
as soon as you start looking at real deals, you start learning what questions to ask. All right. So if you don't know what to ask, you're always going to be at like baby level information. You're never going to really be able to go out and, and take action. You won't know what to study up on either. So I'd start looking at real deals. Chances are, if I, if I was still learning, I probably wouldn't know where all the deals were, but I'd at least be looking at things on LoopNet and um, and Crexy and all the you know, mobile home park store, all these different places, just to start absorbing what a real deal looks like and trying to figure out how to value it. Okay. So from there, number three. So I've went, I've I've basically figured out what I'm gonna do. Then I studied up, okay, and I started looking at real deals to really learn it fast. And then from there, the third thing I do is I would go determine how. And what that means is I would build out my buy box. All right. So what size of deal am I looking to buy? How many lots? How what's the price? You might instead of how many lots, what's the price point? Okay. What what can I afford? If you're looking to just buy properties yourself with your own cash, it's going to depend on how much cash you have, right? So that's going to give you kind of an idea of what you can purchase. Also, you're going to decide what markets do you want to be in? Are you just investing in your backyard or are you actually going out and buying in other markets or around the country? There's not a right or a wrong. Okay, I buy all over the country. Like I have no specific geographic area I have to stay in, but you may choose to do something within a few hours from your home. But you've got to decide that. And then from there, are you going to buy value add properties or are you going to buy stable properties? Are you going to buy properties that have a lot of turnaround opportunity on it? Or are you going to buy properties that are running really smooth, really smooth and kick off cash flow day one the way you want and they're not very management intense? You've got to decide all of that along with other things. Okay. But ultimately, you've got to know your buy box. From there, once you know what your buy box is and what I knew, what I know about my buy box, then I can take that information and then I can create my marketing strategy. All right. Hey, I got some questions here. Uh, all right. Let's get, uh, what are the steps to take in looking at real deals? All right. So like I said, if you just wanted, if, if when you're just in the learning phase before you've even built out your marketing strategy and everything, you're, so I'm going back to step two, right? Um, you're going to want to look on like Crexy, uh, you're going to want to look on um, mobilehomeparkstore.com. I mentioned them already. LoopNet. Um, you're going to be looking at all the broker websites. You're just going to start looking at these properties so that you can start understanding the financials, what information there is around these properties and what you should expect to see on deals so you can learn. That's what I was talking about. So while I'm learning, I'm not sitting back just reading books or in coaching programs. I'm actually looking at real deals to try and understand them better. Okay. Cause that's going to bring up the questions that I know that, that are going to pop up and I'm going to then know what to ask and get answers to. All right. So, uh, I got another question here. Do you pay for subscriptions? Did you, when you started first started, um, maybe drop in the chat what you mean by subscriptions. I, are you talking about like a paid loop net subscription or a Crexy subscription or something like that? I, I assume that's what you're asking. Um, but uh, go ahead and drop that in the chat. All right. I got another one here. What are steps in valuing the mobile home parks? All right. We'll, we'll catch up with that in a little bit here. Okay. Um, I'll, I will come back to that. Khalid. Good question. All right. So um, yeah, loop neck Crexy. So basically what they're asking is, do I, did I pay for subscriptions on those websites? No. I didn't. Um, and except for maybe uh, mobilehomeparkstore.com, I have that. It's really cheap and it sends out the deals a little bit in advance. But other than that, I've never paid for LoopNet. I've never paid for Crexy. And frankly, mobilehomeparkstore.com is fine, but it's not, you're not going to find real deals in any of those places. Okay. Why? Because those are the deals that the brokers have already shopped around to their entire database and couldn't find a legit buyer that would want it. And so like, all right, my whole buyer pool is gone. Let me just put this out to the masses and see who wants to bite on it. That, or if they're like a Marcus and Millichap, they won't do any pocket listings. And all they do is put it out to the masses because they want to get maximum exposure to create a bidding war and max out that price, right? So um, I wouldn't pay for those platforms. Just use the free level of it because really all it's good for is networking with brokers 
okay? And learning the business a little bit, but you're not typically going to buy anything off of those platforms. All right. So, um, thanks for the flames. All right. So, uh, I like that. So basically what we've done is we've determined our buy box. Now we know what we're targeting, right? We've kind of honed in on that. Cause if you just say, I want to buy a mobile home park and then you just start looking at everything, you know how distracted you're going to be. Do you know how like scatterbrained you're going to be? You're going to be looking at deals everywhere and you won't know if it's a good deal or if it's worth buying or if you should pursue it or not because you haven't honed in on it. Okay. So now that we know that buybacks, we're going to get into building out a marketing strategy. And that marketing strategy has to be around that buy box. So like, for example, if you're going to go buy mobile home parks in your backyard, you're only going to go get data, let's say on the properties in that market. If you're going to go national, then you might either want to buy data nationally, or you want to might, might want to do some larger marketing campaigns that reach the masses, but you've got to figure out where you're buying and then create that marketing strategy around it. All right. Um, also, if you're working, if you want to buy in a circuit, certain market, you're going to want to, you know, market or network with certain people that can potentially bring you deals too. If you're, if you're marketing nationally, or if you're buying nationally, then you're going to have to go broader. Okay. So figure out your marketing strategy of, uh, that, that hones in or ties into your buy box. Additionally, you need to figure out your capital source. Okay. I would figure out my capital source and ask myself, where's the money coming from to buy these properties? Because I'm going to tell you a little lie in the world of real estate. Okay. People say that, especially in mobile home parks or any commercial real estate, you might be able to buy homes, a single family home with zero cash out of pocket. Even then you're still going to have a few bucks out of pocket, but in commercial real estate, it, you got to have some cash. Okay. It doesn't mean you have to have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you got to have a little bit of money. Okay. To do marketing and to and actually grow it and to even do a deposit, do your due diligence. Okay. So even if the down payment money isn't yours, that's okay. All right. But you got to have a little bit of cash. That being said, figure out how much cash you have access to. This cash can both come from your own bank account your savings. It can come from maybe an IRA or 401k of yours. Um, there's lots of creative ways to utilize in, uh, investment accounts to roll those into self-directed accounts and then invest those in deals. Um, you can also go out and raise capital from outside investors. And you could do that either with debt, meaning you get loans, which typically there's going to be some challenges with getting debt. You can do it but you're usually going to go and raise what's called equity, okay? Meaning you're going to sell ownership in the deal for bringing in cash to the deal, okay? So you're going to give them part ownership in the deal. Now, I will put out a disclaimer. Don't go just hop on Facebook after this and start talking about you're raising money for deals because there's security laws that you do need to comply with. They are not difficult to comply with, and all it takes is just a securities attorney to help you structure that properly. Not a big deal, not crazy expensive, but there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. So don't go to jail. All right. Um, so therefore, once I know what my capital sources are, my strategy to get capital is going to be, now I've got the lead flow plan and I've got the capital source. You need deals and money, right? Without those two, you're never going to be successful in anything, let alone mobile home park or real estate investing. So from there, um, the next thing that I would do once I had my, my marketing strategy in place and my capital sources in place, then I would go and I would start time blocking. I'm putting myself in the shoes of the person that I was when I got started. I had a business. I was busy. I had a lot going on, but I knew that mobile home park investors, not mobile, real estate investing was where I wanted to be. Okay. I knew that I wanted to get out of you know, running a business daily and I wanted to create serious money coming in from these real estate transactions. Uh, let's hear, don't go to jail if you do. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. All right. Um, I'm not going to repeat that on video, but, um, anyways, so, uh, basically I would time block. I would start looking at my calendar and I'd say, okay, what are my normal hours at work? What are my normal hours in my business? A lot of you guys own businesses, make tons of money, but then you then you don't manage that time well enough to go turn around and start buying the real estate that you want because you're so tied up in that business, right? Or that job. 
um, many of you have great careers and you want to go out and start buying real estate, but it's just the time thing. So I've seen some people be ultra successful in real estate investing and having a full-time job or a full-time business. They just block off their time and they make the time. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to have a full-time business or job and then go out and start buying real estate to replace that business or job without like really seriously making a commitment and crunching and sometimes giving up some things like time with family or friends and some of the things that you like. You're going to have to sacrifice a little bit to actually go out and do it, all right? But I'm telling you, and take my word for this, you do that, it pays off, you get all that stuff and more later, okay? So anyways, my point is, I would time lock. I would start to figure out where I have op opportunities to work. It could be 30 minute windows to get in what needs to be done to hit my goals. All right. But I'm going to find it. I'm probably going to work in the evenings. I'm probably going to get up earlier before I go to work or before I go to the office and get things done. And then I'm probably going to work on the weekends. I'm just going to hustle. That's what I'm going to do because I have to do that in the beginning to get in the position to be able to cut back on the other stuff that pays the bills. Right. Then I'm going to focus on finding a partner as well. For me and most people, we're not great at everything. I sure as heck know I am not great at everything. I am not good with systems and operations, okay? It's just not my personality, and I've recognized that for a long time. So I would go out and find a partner that or an employee. You could even hire an employee, but most people in a job situation or even that have just a, a kind of a... a solopreneur type business, they can't go just hire somebody. So I would look for a business partner that complements my personality really well, that does the opposite that I like to do. Do not go find someone who's good at what you do. If you do, you're going to start bumping heads. It's not going to work out. So you've got to find somebody who is good at what you're not. So I'd find a partner to also free up time of mine and get somebody working on the things that I'm not good at. And then on top of that, I would go find a mentor, all right? I would go find somebody who had a bunch of mobile home parks, who had done it before, and I would actually, I would basically take notes from them. I would spend time with them. I would have them look at my deals. I would have them double check what I'm doing. I would find a mentor that was willing to put in the time and effort into me to make sure that I'm not screwing it up, okay? And then from there, I would turn up the volume. That last step, I would just, Boom, crank it. I would turn up my marketing dollars. I would turn up my marketing efforts. I'd be underwriting every deal I possibly could. I'd be making offers on tons of deals all the time. Even if the even if the price was high, I don't care. I'd be making offers at whatever I could pay. Why? Because it's a numbers game. And I'm telling you right now, this is the trick. Little secret that most people don't recognize. It's the first deal that's the hardest. Once you get over the first deal, you will start to buy more and more parks very quickly. But it's the first deal that always takes the longest. I interviewed Jimmy Johnson on my podcast um, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, if you guys don't know Jimmy, he's wholesaled, I think he's at like number 73 of mobile home parks he's bought and wholesaled out, right? He's the biggest wholesaler in mobile home park industry. And he took over a year to get his first mobile home park deal done. I took a year to get my first mobile home park deal done. Not because, not because it necessarily had to take a year, but because I didn't have some of the things that I'm talking about today. If I could start over and do it all right, I didn't have some of this. So I had to kind of learn and bump my head a lot more than, um, than maybe somebody else has to. Okay. So it's the first deal that cranks. And it was funny because when me and Jimmy were talking about, Jimmy and I were talking about this, I'm like, you know, that's funny because it took me about a year to find, to get my first deal closed. But then after that, I started buying more and more parks. Like shortly after that, I had deal after deal. So it really, it's once you have that breakthrough game over, um, you're welcome, by the way. Thanks for the, thanks for the uh, feedback. Um, but it's getting that first deal that you just got to cram for. And what I see a lot of people do, okay, they get started, they dabble, they start watching YouTube videos, they start watching reels, they start watching short form videos, and they start like hopping on bigger pockets and they dabble, okay? They dabble to the point where they think they're doing it, they think they're getting into it, 
but they're really not. They're just researching. It's, it's, it's entertainment for them. Okay. And so once they realize, Hey, I actually have to like go out and hustle and do this at a rapid pace to get, to get it kicked off. If they ever recognize that they will then go and do it and typically get their first deal. But if they don't recognize that within a, within a certain period of time, and it's different for everybody, but if they don't recognize that within a certain period of time, they burn out, they get distracted and they go do something else. So they find the next, you know, exciting thing, whether it's crypto or whether it's, you know, AI or whether it's all these different things, they just onto the next thing super fast because they're doing the same thing on everything that they're interested in. They never actually go, you know what? Screw it. I'm going all in. I'm going to do this and do the things that I just talked about. Okay. And I see it over and over and over again. You guys don't know how many messages I get. I'm like, Instagram and Facebook and even YouTube, like people message me all the time. Like, Hey, can you look at this deal? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I want to look at deals, but they don't, they don't know enough to, to understand how to value that deal. And I know that if I spend time with them evaluating that deal, nothing's going to happen with it because they haven't went through that intense focused effort to quickly get into it and get into the game. Okay. So it's, it's, it's something that's very common and it's like a red flag, right? When I see that, I'm like, okay, you're, we, we got to get you focused. We got to get you the right information and you got to take massive action. Okay. So all successful people, like if you guys watch my podcast, I don't know, drop in the comments, like just type podcast or just put a P or something in the comments. If you guys have seen my podcast, okay. My podcast um, or just why for yes and for no, I don't care. Just put something in there. If you've seen or heard my podcast, because I interview like all these successful investors, most of them are, are, are real estate investors, very few mobile home park people, mostly just real estate investors, commercial real estate investors, and like very high level entrepreneurs. And when you, when you listen to these guys or girls talk, every single one of them has a serious work ethic. I know that we hear on like social media um, about people who are like, you know, starting businesses and they kind of just do it on the side and it doesn't take much work and they automate everything day one. That's crap. Like I haven't met anybody that's ultra successful, like the people that I interview on my show um, and, and some of my friends that like none of them are doing that. They've all worked hard built the business. Yes, of course you systemize it over time and you're able to step away from it. But in the beginning, they put in the work. So you got to have that mindset and you got to be around people who are doing that. If you're just around people on social media or in bigger pockets or in these chat groups and stuff, they're all doing the same thing. They're just dabbling. You got to get around people who are actually hustling and going out and doing it. Um, how many lots do you have? I bought over a thousand lots. I'm somewhere in the 900s right now. Okay. Um, Good question. And that's, that's across five states. So uh, let's hear. We've got, um, so, so one thing that I want you guys to think about, and I want to go back to the very beginning, that's going to maybe help you guys really hone in on this. It's the mobile home park industry is the most unique and potentially undervalued property type there is. People just overlook it. They think it's gritty. They think it's dirty, whatever. It's not a sexy property type. So they just never consider it. But with the consolidation, the things that we talked about before, I want to point out one more thing on consolidation. It only happens once. Most have never been through it. Okay. Meaning you and I, we probably haven't seen many industries consolidate in our time. And there's not many, not uh, many real estate types or industries in general that haven't consolidated yet. So it's like this just super hyper-focused opportunity that we can take advantage of. I love the fact that seller financing is just running rampant in this industry right now. Like one out of the three deals I'm buying right now are, are seller financed. We just bought another deal, seller financed. Um, the deal I bought in December, seller financed. So like, I'm telling you, there's a lot of seller financing right now because sellers are aware that financing has changed. Interest rates have went up. And so they're like, okay, well, if I really want to sell, I'm going to have to be flexible. It's not a dirty word anymore. I ask every single seller if they want to sell or finance. And you'd be surprised how many people do. 
and these are sophisticated sellers to an extent, like they may not be sophisticated in their operations, but they all understand what seller financing is. It's not like going to a, to somebody who's, who owns a single family home that they live in and going, Hey, do you want to carry paper and having to explain that whole process? Um, you don't have to because they know it. They understand what, se what, what seller financing is. So it's a very easy discussion. Uh, additionally, this is kind of where it's really cool. All right. And this is what's really weird too. Um, you've got, you know, seller financing happening right now at a very rap rampant pace, but you also have very attractive bank financing. Now, interest rates aren't sexy, but I just got a loan for 5.75 in December, refinancing a property. It was a unique situation. Sorry, 5.85. It was a unique situation. It, the deal had drug out a little while with the bank and they decided to honor some of their previous rate, but still I'm getting quoted at different rates, sometimes in the sixes. So, you know, low sixes. So although that's a high interest rate historically, it's not a high interest rate from a cost standpoint. So you're able to still get, you know, very strong financing terms, like 25 year AMS to 30 year AMS. You can get things like, um, 10 year loans, seven, 10 year loans. You there's, there's even, um, Fannie and Freddie finance mobile home parks. So there's a very high demand for debt financing on mobile home parks. Okay. So, but then you also got the bank, or you got the seller financing too. So it's just a really sweet time to be buying mobile home parks when it comes to capital. All right. There's also motivation in the market because you got all these sellers that are getting to the point where they want to retire. That's what's fueling this whole consolidation phase. It didn't just happen. It's because all of these people are getting ready to retire or they're dying off. And so the timing is just forcing them into the market. And with interest rates being high, it, it it's like, okay, well, if I'm going to sell, I got to sell now. Otherwise I might be stuck with this thing for a long time. So it's creating motivation in sellers. And that's something that we can take advantage of. Also take advantage of or benefit from, I should say. There's also a lot of capital looking for a home right now. So both you've got both the, the sense that you've got, somebody said demographics. Exactly. It's the demographics, the age group of people that develop these they are all getting old. They've developed these 30, 40 years ago with their bare hands. And they're like, I'm retiring, but, um, there's a lot of capital chasing good returns right now. And they can't find it. They can't find it in apartments. They can't find it in, in, in traditional real estate strategies. And also they're not seeing it in the market. A lot of people lost a lot of money in the stock market and other, other institutional grade investments. And so there's a lot of money on the sidelines looking for deals. So you've got equity, you've got good debt, you've got motivated sellers, you've got a consolidating industry, you've got all these things like building up. Plus on top of that, our industry has gotten a lot more legitimized over the last several years where people are now comfortable with it. And there's this buyer pool behind you. So if you can buy parks, turn them around, make them run really well, and then turn around and put it on the market, there's tons of buyers for that. So there's a demand for the asset class that there hasn't been ever. Like when I started buying these in 2014, people wouldn't touch mobile home parks. They were dirty properties. They were super sketchy. Nobody wanted to touch them. I'm like mobile home parks, what the heck are you talking about? I'm not buying a trailer park. And so that's changed. So there's a very high demand for the assets that you own now. So later on, when you go to sell it, there's it, it's a, it's 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 a strong strong asset to own. There's no new development happening either. Think about that. Every other property type that you think about, there's new competition coming online. People are developing apartments. They're developing office, retail, industrial. Maybe not quite as much office, but it is being developed a little bit. They can. There's nothing stopping them. Okay. They're developing RV parks. They're dev developing um, everything, marinas. They're developing anything you can think of. But what's the one property type that they're not developing? It's mobile home parks. Why? Because the zoning won't allow it. No, they're, the cities and the, and, the, and the counties are opposed to mobile home parks coming into their city. Why? It's not my backyard, right? And personally, I wouldn't want them in my backyard either. So they're not developing new communities anymore, which means your competition is super limited and you don't have to worry about somebody putting up a building across the street and emptying out yours. And then from there, like you get this cash flow. Like how many of you guys drop in the chat, just drop like flip or wholesale in the chat or in the comments. If you have like flipped, if you're flipping homes or you're wholesaling homes 
or anything like that, like doing some sort of transactional real estate, drop that in the comments. Or if you've even looked into like flipping or um, wholesaling real estate. Okay. Those are like transactional trade based inv investing, right? You're buying something, you're turning around and you're selling it or you're selling a contract. And that's cool. You make money, but you don't make cash flow. Next year, if the market shifts, you're out of business. Next year, if the market booms, you probably make a ton of money, okay, depending on your strategies. So, yeah, we got some people dropping in the chat. That's cool. Um, but the whole point is that with trading models, you have you're you're constantly just at the at the mercy of the market. When you buy rental property, sure, rents can fluctuate a little bit, but when you're buying cash flowing property, if the market sucks for a couple of years, I don't care. Like it's totally fine. If I can't buy anything tomorrow or I can't sell anything tomorrow, doesn't matter. I start making money. Right? I, I keep making money. It just keeps coming in because I own assets that produce cash flow. And that's where the real wealth happens, guys. Commercial cash flowing assets. You do that, game over. It doesn't take many of them to get very, very wealthy and set yourself up. And then, like the cool, the last couple of things that I want to mention about this kind of around the whole benefits of buying these assets is like, you can have other people manage these properties. You don't have to be on site working that business. Like there's a lot of businesses out there that you actually have to, um, that you have to like actually be there. Like I know this guy that has a UPS store and he has to work in that UPS store and run it. That sucks. I would not want to do that. That's a job that owns me here. I can actually have a business or assets that, that have people that work for me to run them. Okay. Both on the ground and potentially even having someone like maybe my management company run the property and even oversee the onsite managers. So like there's ways to do that. Okay. You don't have to have a job to own these things and it's a team sport. Like you can actually partner up with people and find others that get into the deals with you and still both make a lot of money. And it's not these like tight, thin margin deals where you're making five, 10 grand a deal. Like it's hard to partner with people on thin deals like that. But when you're buying these bigger cash flowing properties, you can partner up with people, build a team around it and, 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 and not have to do it all yourself. And um, yeah, wholesaling also a big tax hit. Correct. Yeah. I mean, when you're wholesaling and, and even flipping, there's, you're paying way higher taxes. And then if you're buying things, holding them and getting that long-term capital gains, potentially doing like 1031 exchanges or other strategies to minimize your tax, you also get depreciation. Like there's tons of tax benefits with doing this too. So you actually get to keep way more money. Um, Hey, we got a question here. If you guys got questions, drop them in the chat. Um, I'm going to keep answering them as we're talking here. I think this is a great discussion. You guys are definitely um, involved and I love that. All right. So somebody mentioned rentals as well that they're doing. Cool. Smart. All right. If someone bought you a good deal, brought you a good deal, do you have the systems in place to partner with them, giving them a small equity portion in exchange for the sweat equity so they could learn the business? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. The answer is I've got. I've had a bunch of people bring me deals and I partner with them and we can handle any area of the deal, either all of it or a small portion of it, any, whatever the person doesn't want to do. So yeah, good question, Martins. Um, all right. So guys, if you're serious about going out and buying these mobile home parks and like, not just curious about it in 2023, check out, check out what I've got going on at getrealcashflow.com and watch the case study too, so that you can kind of see a little bit more about it. But I think you guys will see that everything I'm talking about is coming into play. And there's people that are making tons of money. If you guys are in any Facebook groups, like I got a Facebook group called um, uh, Mobile Home Park Investing uh, for Cash Flow. And if you check that out, um, you can actually jump into that and you'll see all the people in there talking about the deals that they're buying, the deals that they're wholesaling. There's This is a very active market and there's a lot of people doing deals. Um, I've got one open spot as well. I just want to kind of let you guys know if you guys got any other questions, drop them in the chat too. But I've got one open spot on Monday. I'm actually going to be in Ohio. All right, Western Ohio. And uh, I'm going to be doing on site due diligence at this property. And that's like the on site inspections and everything that you do at the property. And uh, I've got one spot left for someone to come with me. And it's for um, people in my coaching program. So, like, if you aren't in my coaching program yet and you want to go on Monday, okay, get a hold of Danielle Hicks 
and I'll just drop her name in the uh, in the comments afterwards or something. But it's Danielle Hicks, H I C K S, and she can um, get you information on it. And also, you can still go if that uh, if that spot hasn't been taken. I will warn you, it is first come first serve, and I only am allowing one person. But it's not like just watching me. You're actually going to have a clipboard, and you're going to be working with me. So like. You're going to be measuring stuff. We're going to be interviewing the manager together. You're going to have certain things you got to ask. Like, this is the most immersive training you can possibly get. That way, when you go buy your first park, it's not the first time you've done di due diligence on a park. You have already done it before. It's like, um, it is the most hands-on and advanced training that you can be involved in. So get a hold of Danielle if you guys are interested in that. So, hey, guys, awesome call. What's uh, uh, Let's hear. We got one other comment. Hey, Mario, thanks for doing this. With a value add multifamily prop uh, background, would you do a deep value add, uh, unbankable deal for your first mobile home park deal? Assume it's local and you have the time and money. All right. So basically, the question is first deal, would you take down like a beast of a deal that isn't financeable and really is going to take? like seller financing or cash. It's just a heavy lift, I think is what Pat's saying. And um, for my first deal, and even if it was local and in my back backyard and everything. So I would say this, I would not get into a deal that is so complicated or so hard that it stopped me from buying the next deal in the next three to six months, all right? And the reason I say that is because there's deals that you can buy that are just like massive cash flow, right? I'm sorry, massive upside, not cash flow, massive upside. Okay. You can buy a park with, you know, like 20 sites occupied at 100 total lots, and you can fill that thing up and quadruple the value and make millions, right? That's cool. But the problem is the amount of work that's going to go into that, that one deal. You could have went and bought five deals and taken a lot less risk, been producing cash flow much more, more early on. Yes, it's not, they may not be those huge home runs, but they're also a lot less risky and a lot faster to get to a cash flow position that you're comfortable with. And so I'm not opposed to doing value add deals for your first deals. I I mean, I always have, and that's what a lot of people do, right? But taking bigger swings than you can handle can bankrupt you, right? So you take you take on a deal that you don't even that you're not prepared to take on, especially on your own, then you end up not hitting your targets and all of a sudden you're in a bad position. Now you're not on offense trying to build wealth and, you know, make millions, you're instead trying to protect yourself and trying not to go bankrupt because you did a bad deal. And so I think it's it's just knowing yourself, knowing your available time, knowing the knowledge that you have. If you know enough, if you've got a partner that's got a lot of experience, if you, you know, like there's a lot of those things that are going to come into play. But ultimately, I just wouldn't buy something that could put me at risk. Now, I want to be clear, Pat, this isn't, I'm not telling you not to go big. Okay. A lot of people say, start out small, buy this, you know, buy something really small and just, slowly build your way up. I totally disagree with that. I would go the opposite. I would say, go buy the biggest mobile home park that makes financial sense that you can swing and that you're comfortable with. Why? Because the bigger you, the bigger it is, the more diversification you have. It's not safer. The smaller you go, it's actually more risky. So I would go bigger and as big as I could in the beginning, but I'm not saying do the heaviest lift. There's a big difference between that. Okay. So I would be looking for light value adds, things that I could buy, have very clear path to stabilization, a business plan that I knew I could implement and accomplish and get the returns I was targeting, especially Pat, especially if you're not using your own money. If you've got other people's money that you're bringing into the deal or other passive partners or something like that, I would be very concerned and careful about using other people's money, taking on very high risk deals early on. Okay. It's not, it's, it's not good for them. It may not be good for you. Okay. So I would, that's, that's my advice on that, but definitely don't be afraid to go big. Okay. Just pay attention to the risk level. So excellent question. Cause there's, I mean, what, what a lot of times you see happening is people are trying to get into it. They're watching some YouTube videos and they're doing some kind of like 
light research and then they find this deal, right? And it's a 50%, 75% vacant property. And they're like, oh man, I found a deal because it's cheap and the seller will seller finance it with a hundred, you know, hundred percent seller financing. And they think they've got a deal. There's a reason that that seller is trying to push that property off on you with no money down. It's because they're trying to get out of it and you don't recognize it because you don't have the information or the understanding of what to look for. So um, it's just those really risky deals are better for someone who's got a lot of experience and knows what the heck they're doing with the team and the systems in place and all that. Um, so Pat said, so go with less risk and gain momentum towards more deals. Yep, exactly. Get get that first deal done. Do a deal that you're not like scared. Well, put it this way. You're going to be scared to do every deal, um, especially the first one. And that's okay. Like it's normal, but you shouldn't be doing deals that you're like, oh crap, I could lose my shirt on this thing because I got to hit these crazy performance levels, hit, hit these certain goals within 12 months or 18 months, or I might be negative too much or I can't, you don't, you don't want to do deals like that. Like do a deal that cash flows day one or is darn near it, like maybe breaking even or cash flowing a little bit day one so that you're not getting into deals that you're like having to float. And somebody just said, I can't see what, whose name that is, but they said butterflies are good. I a hundred percent agree. That's such a good, good post because I get butterflies on every single deal I buy still to this day, believe it or not, I still get scared. I still get butterflies. I still get nervous and that's healthy. What you don't want is your fear to control you. Or I wouldn't even say I have fear. I'm just, I, I get the butterflies, right? Because I'm concerned. Am I missing something? What am I missing? What am I not seeing about this deal? Who, is the seller lying to me? Is there anything that could go wrong with this deal? I'm looking for that. So I am nervous a little bit, right? But I push past it and I use that nervous, um, that that nerve, okay, those butterflies to hyper-focus me. I hyper-focus on the information and understanding that deal. And I look at it multiple different ways so that I'm not buying bad deals. Butterflies are good. Okay, that's a good point. Hey, Bradley, um, have you done a novation to buy a mobile home park agreement to buy? Um, no, actually, I haven't done any novations on mobile home parks. Um, I've wholesaled parks, and I own a brokerage that wholesales mobile home parks that are off market that I pass on, but I haven't done any novations. And frankly, I, I don't need to do novations because I've got a brokerage that I can structure it just like a wholesale deal or a novation without having to list or do anything like that. So I can make that money without having to do it. But there's, excuse me, there are people who are wholesaling mobile home parks. Novations, I haven't heard of novations coming into the mobile home park and commercial real estate space. So you might be the first. So go make it happen, man. Um, Martins, 100% agree. My first park, I went safe and small. In hindsight, whether small or large, you have the same, <clears throat> you have the same, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of talking. <clears throat> you have the same problems, but you have a lot more cash flow for the problems with larger property. Hold on. <clears throat> All right, doing a lot of talking. So he said, let me repeat that back because I sounded horrible reading that. Sorry, Martins. 100% um, agree. First park, I went safe and small. In hindsight, whether small or large, you have the same problems, but you have a lot more cash flow for the problems with a larger property, right? So like, think about it. And I always use this analogy. That's a super good point, Martins. Let's say you buy a, you buy a 10 space park, okay? And you have a plumbing break and that plumbing break is deep down in the ground, costs you $4,000 to fix. And you think I'm exaggerating. I've had plumbing breaks that cost me 15 in Minnesota because they're buried so stinking deep um, and they couldn't find the leak. So they're just digging everywhere. So, you know, you have a leak that costs you $4,000 in a 10,000 or a 10 space park. Think about how much that's going to affect your cash flow. Okay. If your whole rent per month is $4,000 a month, 10 homes or 10 lots at 400 bucks a space, make four grand a month. That's your, all your revenue, not your cash flow. That's your revenue. Okay, completely wiped out and you're negative for the month. Where if you buy a hundred space park or even a 50 space park, that four thousand dollars can easily be easily be absorbed. Yeah, it's gonna screw up your returns. You're not excited about it. It's gonna it's gonna mess things up and you're not gonna be happy, but 
you're not like pulling money out of your pocket to pay bills. So it's just the size is definitely the scale. Um, and the more cash flow a property produces, the more protected you are from little things like that. And keep in mind, those costs are the same, whether it's a large property or small property. That property that got had the $4,000 or the $15,000 leak that we had to fix, that could have happened on a 10 space park too. There's nothing different about it. So there are certain expenses that differ with smaller parks versus larger, but a lot of the expenses are pretty much the same. I mean, yeah, your property taxes and insurance will be less, but a plumbing break or electrical work, things like that, um, software, all of that just has a lot heavier weight on, on the expenses on a smaller property than a larger one. Um, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. That's right. Yeah. If you're not pushing yourself and like doing deals that are like exciting you and they're push not pushing you, then you're probably not going to be where you want to be in the future. Like the thing is, is like, we all have this vision of where we want our future to be, especially when we were younger. Like I know in my teens and in my twenties, I was like, shoot, I want this lifestyle. This is where I want to be. And you know, it took, it takes a lot of like pushing yourself and being on the edge of your comfort zone to get to where you want to be, to get to those levels, right? Just doing like a small deal and playing it safe all the time is, is not going to get you there. Now, again, risk adjusted reward, right? So we're going to make sure that we're not buying things that are stupid because they got crazy upside, but they're also got crazy downside. Like you don't want to buy dumb deals either. Um, all right. We got, uh, what's the smallest number of spaces you recommend for a first time buyer? All right. So I'm not going to tell you how many sites to buy. All right. And the reason I'm not going to tell you is because number one, your market could be different, right? Depending on it, it's really not about lot count. It's more about revenue. So I give an example. Um, if you own a park in, let's just say Florida and your lot rent is $500 a month. Okay. You could buy a smaller community than if you bought something in Iowa that has a $200 lot rent. Okay. So it's really not about the lot counts. It's more about how much revenue is being generated. But what you don't want to do is go too small, in my opinion. I wouldn't be looking at stuff less than 30 spaces, personally, if I was just getting started. Like, I won't really consider deals that are less than 50 occupied lots, okay? That's my, like, bottom line threshold because I know that, generally speaking, if I'm looking at a deal with a minimum of 50 occupied lots, it probably produces enough to generate enough cash flow to not only, you know, cover management and cover all the costs and everything, but I've got a nice amount of cash coming in. This is what a lot of people forget. They focus too much on returns, but they don't focus on real cash. Like think about it. You go buy a five space community that kicks off, call it 10 grand a year or something like that. Why don't you just go buy a few, you know, a couple single family homes and call it a day? Like, why are you going to go and buy something like that? So it's just dollars and cents it has to make sense if you're, I didn't mean to make that rhyme by the way. Um, but it's gotta be enough money to make it worth it and make it exciting. Like if you're making a few hundred dollars a month buying a mobile home park, don't waste your time. Go buy something that's going to produce enough cash flow where you only need to buy a few of them be done. Like think about this. You could buy one 50 site community. All right. One 50 site community and be producing enough income to generate $50,000 a year in income. That's huge. Like that's somebody's job gone on one deal. If structured, you know, correctly and obviously the lot rents and everything, I'm giving you kind of like a vague um, example, but we go through that in some of like, if you check out my YouTube channel, I talk about that a little bit in some of my, um, in some of my videos. And I talk about like how many lots it takes to get to a certain amount of cash flow. It doesn't take that much. You just need to go out and buy a couple of them and you could have a hundred thousand dollar a year income. And if that's all you really want, then cool, you're done. You don't have to go build these gigantic portfolios, right? Um, yeah. If it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. That's exactly right. Like just there's sometimes deals are like super good and the return is like, oh man, it's like a 20% cash on cash return year one. I'm like, yeah, but it's like $700 a month. <laughs> 
why am I going to go waste my time on that when I can go buy something bigger and make it really valuable? You know what I mean? Because that that small deal takes about the same amount of work as the big deal. Believe that. Believe it or not, the small park with ten sites, you know, that takes the same amount of work as buying a hundred and ten sites. So. Why are you going to go waste your time, especially if you're going to raise money for the deal anyways? What's the difference if you got to raise a couple hundred thousand or a couple million? Like it's it it's it's all zeros and numbers. Like it's not a big difference and the work that goes into it is exactly the same. You're still going to have to get the private placement memorandum. You're still going to have to do it all the same. So just go bigger, right? Um and I know that sounds like super dumbed down or like ultra easy, but I, I'm serious. Like my smallest deals are usually my biggest headaches. They're the hardest to finance. They're, you know, they're just, they, they take more work sometimes than even the bigger deals. Um, we got a question here. The small park takes way more work. Actually ask me how I know that. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, that it's funny you said that. Um, exactly. It's the smaller deals are, not as attractive. And keep in mind too, the smaller deals take a little bit more time to find buyers for. There's less buyer pool for them, less financing, all that. So it's opposite of single family home. We come, a lot of us come from the single family world. Like I did, I was wholesaling and flipping homes for like eight years. And I always thought the bigger, the harder to finance. Why? Because I was in that old mindset of like their bank, the bank is going to look at me personally and finance the deal based on my personal finances, but that's not how commercial real estate works. They're financing the deal. Okay. Yeah. You're a guarantor. Yeah. You're backing the deal and you got to know what you're doing. They got to know that you have, have some skills to do it, but ultimately they're not lending to you based on your personal W2 income. So, you know, it's, it's, um, you, you should really flip your mindset and go, okay, how do I get to the biggest deal I possibly can? Not the smallest. Um, got to Okay. Yeah. Hey man, great questions. Uh, thanks for subscribing, dude. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Hey guys, keep plugging away. Um, again, check out getrealcashflow.com or you can even jump over to mariodatillo.tv, my YouTube channel. If you're not watching it on here right now, subscribe there for a ton of mobile home park investing info. And I'm looking forward to, uh, seeing you guys on the other side. Let's do some deals. We're going to do this again next, uh, the third Thursday of next month as well. I'm going to keep doing this. Third Thursday of every month, we're going live Q&A. We'll give you guys just tons of value. Have an awesome night.